The cheapest way to a dream home is to build it yourself. Right, get a shovel, Sam. Get plenty of shovels. But can it be done for less than £100,000? If you think outside the box, you can build something extraordinary. Architect Piers Taylor will help families facing dilemmas. But when you can do anything, you don't need to have rooms. But I like rooms. While I, Kieran Long, will show them a world of inspiring design. What do you think of this place? Amazing. It's spectacular. Packed with ideas that can work in any home. This is the kind of thing we want to do for our grandchildren. And they needn't be expensive. You could do the same thing with a couple of trestles and a beautiful piece of timber mm -hmm. on the top. Absolutely, floor. yeah. It's a challenge. In this case, I think we've just got to start again. That's as tough as it gets. It's been one of the worst days of my life. But some will turn low-cost self-builds into fantastic homes. It looks great. It's just fantastic. This time... Wow. We push Alistair and Karen... Looks absolutely fantastic. Very similar to what, yeah. what we have planned. ..to make every inch of their new build amazing. How about making this the kitchen? That's radical. <laughs> what do you reckon? Alistair's not convinced. But will the tough realities of self-building... You start with the best aspirations, and I think you start whittling them down as you get into it. ..dash their hopes of a perfect home. How much have you got to fit the building out? 25,000. No, it's, it's never going to do it. I grew up here in the farm just behind us. Uh, that was where I was born and reared all my life. You know, it was a lovely, quiet, rural location to grow up in, so happy memories. Alistair and Karen dream of a mortgage-free life. They're seizing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to build a family home in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, in a place close to Alistair's heart. Really, from the day we met, Alistair's always said he wanted to build a house at home. And when his mother decided to sell up, we saw that as an opportunity to try and realise that dream. Their dream began when they bought a small plot of family land across the road from the farm. Here we go. Fill this one. That was a big ah, that was good. This is their chance to give son Matthew the idyllic childhood that Alistair enjoyed. This is going to be the garden, essentially. You know, it's, it's going to be his little playground. He'll enjoy running about here. You put your stick in the water That's and it. Give, it, give it a stir. You stir the water. Any fish in there? Building their own home close to family also gives them the chance to design a house to meet the needs of an uncertain future. 2007, I took ill. I went straight into the local hospital here and they did a battery of tests on me and it um, finished up with an MRI brain scan, which clearly indicated multiple cirrhosis at that stage. You can't change what's happened. Deal with it as best you can. Um, don't let it take over your life. Uh, I think, and there's a life to be lived. Get on with it. And that's one set. That's one set. Alistair's MS diagnosis has influenced their design decisions and underpins the whole reason for this house. It doesn't have to be level access at the back, as long as you have level access at the front. I think, certainly on balance, on the plans, and what we can see in front of us, the house should be totally um, future-proof for wheelchair use, you know, if it comes to it. Yeah, we wanted to try and put a lot of thought into it before we started anything, because we know, you know, it's very difficult to go back and change anything, and we're limited budget-wise. Okay. The sale of their old house has given them £100,000 for the build and a small contingency. If we can possibly be mortgage-free, that would be the dream for us. Under circumstances, take the pressure off um, whilst having to work or anything like that in the future. But building a low-cost home and living mortgage-free on this sloping site is going to be tough. Slab number one. To make it suitable for future wheelchair use, they've already spent a fifth of their budget on foundations. So we're talking about £22,000 to get to this level. I mean, this is this. double what it would have cost to do normal foundations. At least double, yeah. That's lessons we're learning, being completely novice at it and first time, so... With costs already spiralling, this couple are in desperate need of help to complete the rest of this build within their 100 k budget. I've spent 20 years writing about architecture and I'm fascinated by how we use the spaces in our home. 
As an architect, Piers is constantly finding new ways to use materials. I've gone to his studio to see how we can help the couple achieve the best house possible on their budget. This is the first time we get to see their plans. Alistair and Karen are building a single-storey blockwork and render house in three distinct sections. The house is entered via a covered carport, leading to a glass entrance hall which links both wings and houses a small utility room. To the right, access to the main living area is through a wide doorway, leading to a double-height, open-plan living, kitchen, dining space. On the other side of the glass link, a long corridor gives access to three bedrooms and two bathrooms. This is an ambitious build, especially for someone who's never done it before. Alistair and Karen have spent about 20% of their budget already on foundations, so they've got a tough challenge. The bungalow has a kind of bad reputation, doesn't it? I mean, it's very much associated with the 70s, with kind of large floor plans, with very dark spaces in the centre of the floor plan. You're right, but what they've done here is to make two slightly smaller bungalows, and that's nice, but they still have a long corridor and they have a piece of space in the middle of the house which doesn't seem to do very much. This is going to be a real puzzle, isn't it? Because it's a glazed link, which you can sort of understand architecturally why you would have that thought, but it has no function. And it's the most expensive bit per square metre to build because you've got to have big pieces of glass, a flat roof. We have to try to get them to think about what these spaces are actually for and how they're going to live in them. I think that's right, and I think we also need to get them to find a way of reducing the perceived length of this corridor, because this will seem like a long, dark tunnel to nowhere. I'm just wondering about its image as a rural building. It sits in a context of farms and of quite sort of messy sheds, and it's this perfect white render. This feels to me very much like a house that doesn't really have material or texture. The vernacular locally is things like black metal, black slate, and materials that are quite robust. Maybe one of our key tasks is to find a way to give it some material, give it some character, give it a sense of belonging through that stuff. It's even more essential that Alistair and Karen think about how this fits into the context, because this is where Alistair grew up. I mean, it feels to me like they need to add something that's really a sign of their generation's approach to this beautiful place. This is going to say something about Alistair 50 years after he grew up in this place, it's essential he gets it right. Piers needs to talk to them before any of the walls start to go up. Hi, Alistair. How, How are you doing? Piers? Nice to meet you. Hi, Karen. Hi, Piers. Piers. To get them thinking about how they will use the spaces they're building. So what I want to do is to mark out where this utility is, mark out where that corridor goes, and just get a handle on whether or not it's the right thing to do to put the utility there. So let's grab some of these and um, map, yep, sure. map it out. Let's yep, get them up. Okay. For any self-builder, mocking up the interior walls is a great way to understand the space. It's actually wider than what I thought yeah. it was. Yeah. It's much more spacious than I thought. Basically, it was so I wouldn't skim my knuckles in the wheelchair. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, thinking future-proof. Seeing this mapped out, I think I realise that this utility room really compromises the potential of this space if you left this exactly as it was. But then what else were we going to do with a glass, you know? How about taking out the utility and making this the kitchen? That's radical. <laughs> That's a big change. Yeah, that a big change. Moving the utility out of the glazed link and making the most expensive part of the build a centrepiece kitchen would make it the heart of the home. Now, Piers has to figure out if it's possible. So, seeing it like this, you, know, you can see that this is a big room, and as soon as you cut into it, what it does is stop you using this glazed space yep. effectively, I think. But the options for here are moving your utility there something like that, and you had a door going into it from underside the carport, so you could have your kitchen all down this end, and you could have a big dining table down there if you wanted. Our only concern 
with that would be one to eat into this bedroom yeah. a little bit mm. Um, mm. to put because we, we would like a utility yeah. somewhere mm. and two a access if we were ever at wheelchair yeah. phase yeah. might sure. be a bit more difficult with the kitchen yeah. in the middle. Mm -hmm. Moving the utility out and the kitchen into the link is too big a step for Alistair and Karen, so now Piers must find a way to reimagine the space so it's not dominated by the utility room and long corridor. Option two is possibly cutting that nib back to there, but then just doing something yeah. different with this. It could have a curved geometry. By putting the curve in it. It Your cordy sensi yeah. starts here then. It does. So, totally. Cool. Yeah, no, I think that's a great a idea. idea. And it's something we hadn't even thought of. This is a simple and elegant alteration which would help differentiate the bedroom corridor from the entrance hall. By softening the utility wall into a curve, the glass link becomes a functional living space. Widening the door into the open plan living room helps the flow from one area to the next. Piers also wants to challenge them on their ideas for the exterior. Their current plan is to render both blocks. But he wants to show them a way to make their home feel more in keeping with the rural environment. So this is the farm, isn't it, that you grew up in, Alistair? Here. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. it's amazing seeing it from this field because there are two buildings that we can see here and, in effect, that is a similar composition to your house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hadn't thought of looking at it that way, linking the buildings with the gap in the middle, which is you know, what we'll have as well. And then there's a palette of materials. One is rendered over block work, the other clad entirely in that beautiful black sheet material. That black with all this green looks amazing, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah. Absolutely. It stands out really sharp there. Really, really nice. Does. And it belongs here. Yeah, yeah. Piers hopes to convince them to use the same materials on their build. So this is a sort of entirely black, corrugated, simple building. This yeah. with glass next to it. Yeah. I think it'd be lovely. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like the way you've done that there. Simple materials used everywhere are what makes these types of buildings and that black barn beautiful. Changing external materials would have planning and building regulation implications but Piers' suggestion would make a striking architectural statement. Replacing the white render and roof tiles on the bedroom block with black corrugated sheets will give this wing a barn-like feel. The contrast between that and the white rendered living block will make the glass link stand out and the overall effect will be in keeping with the rural landscape. Piers has suggested some good ideas today, which we hadn't really looked at or considered. I think it's given us the push that we needed, maybe to jump in with both feet and go for it. So I think that's... Well, it's definitely a push for us to start costing that side of things up. It took Alistair and Karen almost four years to get planning permission for their build. Now, after just six weeks, the block work is up to roof level and the trusses are already going in. I have the lead there for the lead tray, maybe get it done today. It's reasonably straightforward. Finishing the block work has taken their spend to around £33,000, and they've budgeted a further £10,000 for the roof. To keep costs down, Alistair is doing as much labouring as possible, and having his builder brother George living close by is a huge advantage. It's been great having him help us. Essentially, I may be the project manager, but without George's help here, we couldn't have done it. Do what I'm told, basically. <laughs> That's usually the way it is. He keeps doing what he's told, and everything will be OK. <laughs> With the internal walls in place, the footprint of the house is becoming clearer. Well, that's the big entrance through there. Yeah. It's three, three metres-ish, maybe. Alistair and Karen have taken on board Piers' idea and widened the doorway into the open-plan living space. And they've also curved the utility wall. This has transformed the glass link from a hallway to a potential room. But they still have no idea what to use it for. The centre link obviously is not really taken up with anything else. At the minute, it's just spare space. 
there's a huge risk that the two and a half thousand pound glazing bill for this space will be completely wasted if its sole function is a corridor. They need to decide how to use this space now before it's too late to put that money to better use elsewhere. The design for Alistair and Karen's house really hinges on this glass linking piece connecting the two blocks of accommodation. And I think Piers has pushed them really hard to try to get them to think about that room as something interesting. I've brought them to the Highlands of Scotland to see a house that elegantly resolves the same problem. I'm hoping it will inspire them to push their building further. This is Torres Pardon Cottage, an incredible private home near Aviemore. This contemporary building uses old materials with modern ones to create a distinct line between old and new. So I love this view from here where you start to see these pieces coming together, but what's your first impression? You can see the glass link and it looks absolutely fantastic. Similar elevations to ours. Once the site of an old croft, architects Stuart Archer and Liz Marinko used reclaimed materials from the original buildings to create two traditional stone walled structures linked by a contemporary glass block. From a distance, it looks like it's three separate buildings, and then yeah, you see this glass see connector. You, know, you don't see that from a distance. No, you, know, you put your finger right on it. I mean, that whole idea of trying to just disconnect these pieces yeah. and in a way make them look a bit like separate buildings is sort of achieved by these pieces of frameless glass. Alistair and Karen are clearly impressed by the outside, but I want them to experience how the interior might help them visualise how they could inhabit their own house. Wow, fantastic. Beautiful, so this is how they've used that glass linking piece. Here, the glass link is a beautiful kitchen dining space full of clever ideas that make the most of its stunning position. By using two or three simple neutral colours, you can increase the sense of space without detracting from the view. A bespoke roof light matches the dimensions of the units and is positioned to throw natural light onto the work surfaces. And the positioning of the dining table makes the most of the panoramic view. And don't you just want yours to be more than just an entrance, more than just a front door when you see this? The whole thing works superbly, but of course their link is so much wider than ours would be. Yeah, but I mean, this it's is much bigger than yours yeah. on plan. Yeah, yeah I suppose, absolutely. I suppose the interesting thing here is how they found a way to inhabit this wonderful space. Just think about how that piece that you're building in the middle there could take on more than just entrance and kicking boots off and, and getting to the lounge. I think yeah. the solution, having just looked at it, is this. The dining Possibly area. a dining area in there. The so you think you would have the possibility to bring yeah, some to bring the dining area furniture in there? Yeah. And, yeah. As a dining space, I think it would work well. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a great idea yeah. to me. It really does. Alistair and Karen have seen the value of turning their expensive glass link into somewhere they can use every day. Now I want to push them to see other ways they can raise their home out of the ordinary. I really like how the whole house is united by this single floor material. And you can see all the way down to the very extent of the house in that direction. And in this direction, it sort of leads you through to the other living space. And of course, the doors too being hidden away, almost invisible. I mean, this is absolutely beautiful way of just removing barriers between rooms. You can buy pocket door kits from as little as £100. Avoiding swinging doors helps declutter rooms and improves the flow between spaces. The door leads to a double height living area. Just like Alistair and Karen's, this has a vaulted ceiling. But here, extra light comes from a series of skylights. It's so clever how this building takes you through all these different atmospheres. And here you see how height can have an effect. I just wonder whether there's any potential in your two blocks to create a bit more of that drama and that sort of spatial experience. When you see the light coming in, that's something you possibly could look at incorporating before it's too late, putting in the Velox of some description. Light also floods in from the corner picture window. Butting the panes up against each other removes distractions and invites you to enjoy the view. 
it's one space but it's zoned so you can sit and have a wee snog and a read in that bit but the really comfy living, much better TV in this bit but it's still the same room. Here you get a sense of a, a whole sort of terrain mm. that you can occupy in different ways, always with the view, always with beautiful light. I think when you look at on plan you tend to stick with what's there but seeing something like this is fantastic because it does show you how you can utilise mm. the space much better I think. Yeah I think that's right. Um, or for different purposes you know. Seeing how the space is used here has given Alistair and Karen inspiration for their own build. We're living with lots of ideas. Plenty to go away home with and think about and try and plan and to, to our design to now before, and corporate. You know, before we get too far in, at least we can use some of these ideas. Um, absolutely, there's half a dozen or more things here that we would like to look at and do. I think Alistair and Karen seem to have really enjoyed seeing a house that so closely mirrors the one they're designing. They seem to immediately see the potential of their glazed link as somewhere to inhabit and somewhere to use. As soon as they saw the dining table downstairs, they were saying, yes, we can do this. And I think it's opened their eyes. It's October. Alistair and Karen need to get the roof finished and the building watertight before the weather starts to turn. Alistair is working long days on site, doing as much as he can. But Karen is constantly aware of the toll this could take on his health. You tell him to rest, but he's happy enough to keep going, so I try and just let him do what he thinks he's capable of. I think you always worry, you know, it's in the back of your mind that he's got MS, but he knows how to manage it and he's on his medication and just try and keep the pressure off here. After Piers's visit, they were keen to use materials that would help their bungalows sit in the landscape. They wanted natural slate tiles for the living block roof, but to keep costs down, they've opted for a mass-produced tile instead. These are a fibre cement slate, essentially. I suppose you could call them a fake slate, but they're so much cheaper than, you know, genuine slate. Straight away, that was something we had to make a decision on, you know, our budget didn't stretch to that. So again, it's a compromise on cost um, against what you're after at the same time. But they still want to go with Pierce's idea of using corrugated black sheets on the walls and roof of the bedroom block. But that's proving difficult. This, we can get local, but we can't get the black colour. It has to be ordered in from England. Um, Right. I think in hindsight, if we'd gone from the very start and planned that in, we would have went with that, but I think we've left it too late in the game too. And the cost of bringing it across, plus if you forget a piece and you haven't measured it correctly, you can't just go and grab a piece locally and, and repair yeah, it or whatever. Out of the options, I think that's probably maybe not achievable for us just at this point, I think. You start with a wish list of all the things you would really love in your ideal perfect home and then your budget tells you what you can and can't yeah, have, basically. Yeah, it starts to dictate then. You start with the best wishes in the world and the best aspirations, and I think you start whittling them down as you get into it. But of course, you don't realise the cost of things until you start the process. And... After such a disappointment, it's easy to lose heart. It's four years since they bought the land and started the project, and they're getting ground down by the building process. With the budget so tight, it's tempting to go for easy options, but they're in danger of compromising key design details. We need to find them another solution for the outside finish fast. Alistair and Karen are at a real turning point in terms of not quite knowing how to finish the outside of their building and for most architects that's the most important bit how a building sits in a landscape and the detail of it the material all of it the composition of the outside of the building is really important to get right traditional rural buildings sit effortlessly in the landscape but that's tough to pull off with new builds but I've found a contemporary house that works perfectly within its rural context and might be the key for us to help Alistair and Karen's home. This is T. Prem in the Brecon Beacons, an ultra-modern building designed by architects Field and Fowles and inspired by its surroundings. 
One way to make a very direct reference to a context is, of course, to use a material that comes from that place. And there aren't many more Welsh materials than slate. And this building uses recycled slates. It's beautiful and robust and has a certain character. But we can also see that it's not structural. Slate is, of course, a very thin material. And this is just cladding a very, very modern frame behind. And I love that because it means the building somehow tells a story of something very, very ancient and old and something totally contemporary. Using the same slates on the roof and the walls and concealing the gutters gives the building a barn-like shape. The cladding here is like a finely tailored suit. All of the materials meet in a very sharp way and beautiful way. It just goes to show that a building with such a simple silhouette really takes effort in the details to achieve. Using recycled slates on the exposed north side helps protect it from harsh weather. On the south-facing side, they were able to use a slightly less robust material. The southern side of the building is clad in larch, locally grown just a couple of miles from here and sawn on site. And you can see that it's been untreated and it's beginning to warp and bend now and take on a real character. And I love that. I mean, it looks like an old coaching inn or something starting to settle down into its site. So I love this ambiguity between ancient and modern that a beautiful natural material like this can bring. This is a stunning example of a perfect finish that suits its rural context. The huge challenge for peers is achieving this level of beauty within the limitations of Alistair and Karen's budget. All of the buildings I've done here over the years have been as frugal as possible. I mean, what's curious about this building is that it's only stripy because we didn't have enough wood to finish it. And we worked out where we could use the wood we had and then just introduce a black waterproof membrane behind that wood to allow the building to be waterproof. Piers has an idea about a material they are already using on their build. This is your tile, isn't it? Is that exactly mine? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I guess I just thought, why wouldn't you just use the same thing mm -hmm. on the walls and hang it in the same way? Well, I've never seen hung slate you know, before. Yeah. I think we should hang them now together and see what they look like. Definitely, mm -hmm. I think Brilliant. so too. Using their choice of roof tiles on the walls as well has an added advantage. OK, next one. They could do it themselves. You can just cut it with a knife. Like one, two, three times. And then you can just... Yeah, super. There you are. That's it. Perfect. Using the same material to cover an entire block would be a dramatic design feature. So what do you reckon, looking back? Looks really crisp yeah, and sharp. Very um, sharp, very clean looking. It looks great yeah. against the, the greenery, which yeah. we've got behind with the trees. This is less than £10 a metre, isn't it? And compared to other cladding things, I think this is probably about as cheap as you can go. Yeah. I'm chuffed to this one. I really think it's, it's the answer we're looking for. This could be the perfect solution, but they may need to reapply for planning permission. It's a big day on site. While work continues on the roof, the bespoke glazing units, which are a key feature of their design, are being fitted. There's over £8,000 sitting there, so near 25 pieces all told. It's a significant part of our money. Inspired by the house we saw in Scotland, they've added skylights into the open plan living block. When choosing windows and doors, insulation and energy efficiency are key. With so much glazing in this build, Alistair has opted for a higher specification than building regulations required. We could have went with 70mm frames, which is the normal window frame that you would have went for, but um, we were able to get the 90mm frame for very little more money, which we felt at the time was probably worth going for. It. With all 25 units installed in just one day, there's a definite sense of progress, and they're well on their way to a watertight building. It's late November. The family have been living in the caravan for over 16 months. What, you want one more? I'm going to have these. While Karen's at work, Alistair is taking care of Matthew and running the build. He's took a real bad dose of chicken pox this week, so it's 
held us back a little bit in so much as I had to take a couple of days to look after him. These things happen, I guess, and uh, it's for the last few days out of it, but not to worry. They managed to get the house watertight before the winter, but work has slowed right down. It's a little bit frustrating sometimes when things don't always go to plan and schedules aren't kept. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it just it goes on and on and the money just disappears rapidly, but sure, you've started so you have to finish, but we'll get there, I think. The reality of self-building is clearly having an impact on Alistair. So I've come to check in with Karen to see how he's coping. Do you ever get worried about him? Yeah, I mean, he is doing a lot and, you know, he does get tired and then there is still, you know, inevitably, there are still responsibilities, you know, at home as yeah. well. So it is a lot for him to take on. Mm. Are there ever times where you wish you'd just bought a house and not had to live in this place for a year and a half? I think probably six months ago, I wish we'd have just bought a house and didn't have to do all this. But now it's like, well, I can see you can see the benefit of doing yeah. it yourself. You know, you can see what you what you've worked towards and what you're going to get at the end. So, you, and it's a lovely site up there. And it's a great place for Matthew, which you know mm. we couldn't have afforded if not. Yeah. You know, so that's brilliant for him. After the disappointment of not being able to use corrugated sheets on the bedroom block, I'm keen to find out what's happening with the outside. We had went with peers and um, looked at the hung slate, mm. and we were really impressed with it. So we made a decision that's really the finish, but like to go to maximum Great. tiles. It does mean we have a process to go back through with planning out, obviously. We'll give it a go if we can get permission to do it. We would love to do it. It would have been very easy when the guys were plastering the outside of this block to say just plaster on and finish it. So well, I'm proud of you that you stuck to your guns. Is it a bit nerve wracking waiting for that planning decision? Well, it's in the hands of the, yeah. the planners now, really. They have no idea how long the planning decision will take, but while they wait, they should really be pressing on with the inside. First of all, I mean, I'm blown away by the space. I'm really, really seriously impressed with it, but it does feel a bit quiet on site today. And I'm just wondering how it's going, you know, how it's going with the interior, because, you know, there's still a lot to do in here. Absolutely. It's a bit like a graveyard today. It seems to be with the building trade that, you know, there's guys are caught in one job, it delays, it rolls over. So it's a knock on effect. I think there's no point getting wound up about it. Um, you just have to accept it, and that's the way it goes. So, And in terms of the money, in terms of what you've got left to spend, how, how much have you got to fit the building out? We're about 75,000. Yeah, up to here we spent about 75,000. So. Right. In reality, it leaves us 25,000 or just over to finish it. No, it's, it's never going to do it. Alistair's right. At the moment, this large building is just a shell. There's still the plumbing and electrics, the kitchen and bathroom fittings, the plasterboarding and all the internal finishes to be done. They could easily spend 40 to 50,000 pounds on finishing a house this size. Karen, how much over do you think you're going to go then, over the 100,000? Realistically, we wouldn't like to go any more than 20,000 pounds, I would say, over budget. Mm. I mean, and that's everything finished. Realistic, we're probably looking at a small loan or a small mortgage to, to cover that amount, I would say. This is a real blow. They wanted to be mortgage-free because of the uncertain future due to Alistair's health. So it is going to be about borrowing and spending money you don't necessarily have, so it feels like <coughs> Piers and I have got some help to give you in terms of ideas to finish cheaply mm. and efficiently and beautifully. To get to the finish line now is going to be tight with us, certainly for budget. Um, mm. So any, any ideas that we feel that could be used, we're absolutely up for using them. So. With money rapidly running out and planning decisions pending, the build is losing momentum. I need to remind them of what they could achieve if they can just keep going. I've brought them to County Kildare in the Republic of Ireland to see a house that I hope will give them the push they need to finish their build. So here we are. Looks fantastic, looks like it's dropped in from outer space. This is the Sea House, designed by Stephen Connolly, Alan Connolly and Gronya Daly. This is a contemporary interpretation of an Irish bungalow. I know you're a fan of slate. The slate is the exact slate that we have got, actually. I think it's quite interesting how the architect here has brought that colour down to the walls as well, this charcoal grey wall. It actually works very well there. This is an impressive exterior, but it's the inside space that I think they'll really appreciate. This fabulous open-plan kitchen dining space is the heart of this contemporary home. So hopefully you can see why I wanted to bring you here, guys. I mean, this is a really beautiful space. With its vaulted ceiling and windows on three aspects, this room is strikingly similar to Alistair and Karen's plans. 
One of the things I think is really successful here is this lighting scheme, a mix of indirect and direct light. It's beautiful. I love the high ceilings and the skylight. That's brilliant. I can see how effective it is here. Just a very simple bulb, no lamp shades, uh, and it really, really works across this space. And definitely not expensive either. These are standard off-the-peg pendant fittings, which you can buy from around £10. The flexibility to hang them at different lengths makes these ideal for very high ceilings. The island here, is this sort of how you imagine yours yeah, to be? Yeah, it's very similar to something we have planned. Kitchen islands are really popular, but you have to think carefully about positioning. There's quite a gap yeah, between the island good. and the kitchen, and that really works well. It allows through passage of people crossing. We could actually move ours across to make the bigger gap. This layout was designed with socialising in mind, so the 1.6 metre gap leaves plenty of circulation space. Whatever size your kitchen is, the main thing to factor in is enough clearance for opening doors. Using mirrored glass as a splashback cleverly reflects light back into a room. It's quick to install and easier to clean than tiling, but you have to use toughened glass. So one of the things I think we all notice right away is this beautiful table. It's just fantastic, isn't it? It's super, it's very simple design to Super it. minimal and it fits yeah. the space beautifully and it's the same timber as the windows. And what's wonderful about it is that it was designed by the architect for the space, um, made by a joiner in Ireland here for a thousand euros. And for me, that would be a great addition to an interior anywhere, especially in a house like yours. Just one piece of bespoke furniture can totally transform a room. This is a modern interpretation of a classic farmhouse table found in homes throughout rural Ireland. Alistair and Karen should look for ways to introduce details like this into their home. I think there's certainly stuff that we can do yeah. and ideas that we can take away from here. The lighting, for instance, um, moving the kitchen island. The island is a similar size to that, so really moving it doesn't cost us anything. I think it does give us a wee lift we need, the inspiration, the enthusiasm, get cracking on again and the big push for the finish now. Two months have passed and the whole house has been plasterboarded, ready for painting. In a space this big, that's an expensive and time-consuming job. But Alistair's found a shortcut. We had looked at costing the high shop at the very start to get it sprayed um, and we had figured it was somewhere 1,500, 2,000 pounds to get it sprayed. But we managed to get a guy to come in and quote for it at £370. It's much cheaper than what we ever expected it to be. For self-builders, it's tempting to try and save money by doing as much as you can yourself. But sometimes, cleverly outsourcing jobs to the professionals can work out to be the cheaper option. This machine here is worth about four to five men. Um, if you were to put maybe two painters in here on a Monday morning, they wouldn't have this finished. Well, it would take Wednesday night before we'd get it finished, whereas I can do it in a day. But even with such a big saving in both time and money, they're still financially stretched to the limit. Money's getting tight now, so it's at the end of the build where you have to you know, really watch what you're spending on. Certain things can't be avoided, you have to pay for them. Even with money so tight, Alistair is keen to put some kind of sliding partition between the living space and the glass link. This is a chance to build something bespoke into the fabric of their home. I think Alistair and Karen could actually take a few risks. It's all too easy just to go and get the materials you're familiar with, timber and plaster and paint and those sorts of things. And actually, they could use a few materials that really defined this house and made a big difference. This is an area where Alistair is keen to bring ideas that reflect rural Ireland into their home. Your opening is something like three metres or so, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a big wide opening. So you're definitely going to make a sliding door which you can, you know, hang on some kind of track. Yeah, we still want to do a, a big commercial-style sliding door between the two, and actually what we're sitting at, we looked at it earlier, and yeah, something exactly. that would be perfect for us. One of the worries about using plywood is that when it's shut, this becomes a forgotten space. It's a good idea to have the kind of sliding door you'd find in a rural building, but get the material wrong and the magic of the space could be lost. The quality of light that'll come from this could allow us to think about using a different type of material. I mean, this is a, a sort of honeycomb. Yeah, yeah. It lets the light through, but... Still obscures. You can get ones with 
dichromatic film. Oh, oh right. that's so it gives nice. Yeah. Uh, however, the that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's fantastic. Yeah. The problem with this stuff is that it is quite expensive. There is another option which is more affordable than this. Let me grab a sheet. This stuff is polycarbonate, super cheap. And this is left over from when I was building this place. Polycarbonate sheets like these are readily available in builders' merchants. They come in a range of widths, thicknesses and colours, and most places will cut them to size. This is used for shed roofs and things. But this doesn't look like something you just find on a shed here, does it? No, absolutely not. Particularly if you get, like, a beautiful frame made up. I was up. just going to say, if it's a nice frame yeah. made... Yeah. yeah. So what sort of money's in a sheet of this, just out of curiosity, you? About 20 quid a sheet. No, I like that. That's, it's an alternative to that. The quality of light is still great coming through there, isn't it? I mean, it's beautiful stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we could absolutely uh, make a nice door out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can see them really mulling this over. I don't quite know what configuration they'll use it, but I think they will use this. If not in the door, then maybe somewhere else, but I'm hoping the door. It's April. After almost two years in a mobile home, the family are desperate to move into their new house. Right, hammer it in with that. But the outside still isn't finished. After waiting months for planning permission to clad the bedroom block in hung slate, they were asked to submit a whole new set of drawings, which would cost several hundred pounds. A new set of plans is a lot of money, and that's with no guarantee of it actually being passed at the end of it. So we just made the difficult decision then Right, but it's better that we pull out at this point rather than throw more money at it. We're very, very disappointed with the whole way things turned out with that. They have no choice but to revert to their original plan to white render both blocks. This is a really big disappointment for Alistair and Karen because the hung slate would have made all the difference to what could be quite an ordinary house otherwise. I think if they'd hung on, they would have got an approval for the slate, but they were just ground down by the system and needed to get on. We were sorely disappointed with the slate issue, yeah. um, but it just got to the point we had to really pull the plug on it. Yeah. Um, all is not lost yet. I think there's still some things you could do to make this a bit different. <laughs> so okay. let's go inside anyway and have a look. OK, let's go. Piers has an idea to make a feature of the rendered walls and tie the inside to the outside. What about painting that whole corner a bright colour? So that wall there and that. This outside? That outside wall and, and that. that left-hand corner. Yeah. So standing here, it would stop this feeling like a corridor, but also just arriving at the house and seeing it as a bit different would be great. I think it's a good idea, and it's not an expensive option no. either. And I do like the way it ties the outside to the inside. Exactly. Um, now, you need to do both or not at all. Uh, not at all, yeah. yeah. Before changing the external colour of your house, you should consult your local planning authority. What about that kind of colour? That's that, yeah. That yellow is great, isn't it? I mean, the sort of acid, bright yellow. Yeah. The off-the-peg kitchen, including appliances, has cost over £10,000. It's practical, but Piers is concerned it just isn't working in the space. However nice this kitchen is, at the moment I think it floats slightly in this sea of white. And I wonder about making the storage actually tie this whole kitchen into this corner. And for example, if you designed a storage thing to run along at the height of that top cupboard around there, and drop down here, it could be great. Could your lens about three or four thousand? <laughs> well, actually, you could do that really cheaply. I mean, we can draw it and see how it'll work. What I'm suggesting is homemade, low cost pegboard, and you wrap it around like that. You can make your own out of MDF, which is about 12 quid a sheet. What do you reckon? Yeah. Uh... Alistair's not convinced. I think what we ought to do is just do a panel and do it with the holes and the dowels and see what it's like. My limited DIY skills, even I can maybe do that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> After the disappointment of the slates, we need to help the couple add some bespoke touches to their home for as little outlay as possible. So let me go and grab the grey paint. Okay. Not having seen your kitchen, I just got something that was neutral and grey. 
So all we've done in about 15 minutes is drill these 15 mil holes for the dowel. If you had another hour, we could actually get it all done on the yeah, roof. Yeah, we probably could, shouldn't we? We <laughs> did the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it there. So, no, just bring that forward a tiny bit. So, let's see how it looks with some cups on. What do you reckon? No, I am really impressed with it. I, I was apprehensive, maybe. Yeah, suspicious. Suspicious about it, but no, I like it. Great. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's two good ideas to come out with today, Piers. You can go home if you want. <laughs> <laughs> It'll definitely stand out, that's for sure. And we'll blame Piers if it all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> Alistair and Karen are racing to put into practice Piers's ideas and finally finish their house. Before I started this process, I could just about have built a dog kennel, probably. And now we're at the end of the process. I could still build a dog kennel, but I could probably do it slightly quicker because I've got a nail gun. The last big job is the sliding door. There's 3.8 metres. They've gone with Piers's polycarbonate idea. And we want to be two there. The track is up. I'm just going to run, put this up against. But they still don't know how to put it all together. Would you screw that in, would you? Um, might be too industrial looking, but this is right. too short. Alistair and Karen have been incredibly willing to adopt our ideas. But are they enough to do the trick and turn their bungalow into something extraordinary? Building a house for £100,000 is tough enough. But for Alistair and Karen, they were taking on the added responsibility of this beautiful place that they know and love. There was always the risk that a new building in this setting might detract from the beautiful character of Alistair's childhood home. So have they managed to create a place where the next generation of their family can really put down roots? After a 10-month build and a few challenges along the way, Piers and I can't wait to see what they've achieved. Hi. Hi, Gary. Hi, Hi Gary. Nice to see you. Nice Hi, nice to see you. Great to be here. It's mm -hmm. looking so fantastic. Yes. Look, it's crisp and clear and, and finished. finished. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're pretty happy with it now. You had some challenges along the way. I remember when we last spoke, you had all sorts of creative ideas about cladding and ambitions for the outside. Yeah. How do you feel about the result? We're very happy with how it looks. It's very sleek looking, we think, so... A little bit of me thinks, well, simplicity has won. Yeah. yeah. I think it works really well. Reverting back to their original plan for two white rendered blocks has paid off. The pristine white is complemented by Alistair's bargain fake slate roof tiles. And I'm pleased to see they've fully embraced Piers's idea for a splash of colour. Alistair and Karen have kept their finishes very simple. No fascias or soffits, and their choice of plain black window frames and simple concrete sills keeps the look clean and sharp. I'm really keen to go and look at this window, which is like a little bit oh, of right. kind of modernism. <laughs> you know, this, this corner taken away, just this slot cut out. It really is lovely, and how much nicer than just a single opening. And I love the way that there isn't any load-bearing structure between here and here. There's just a lintel that runs yeah. around. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a beautiful little detail. The bungalow is unashamedly a modern building, yet still looks at home in its rural landscape. The outside is a real success, but the big question is, has that tricky glass link worked as well? Wow, what a brilliant space to come into. This is fantastic. What could have been wasted space is now a beautiful dining area. Taking inspiration from the house we saw in Scotland, they've moved their table, freeing up space in the living room and making the most of the view. Originally, this was rather a mean little lobby, wasn't it? With a hard corner here, a conventional corridor, and actually quite an unusable space. And now, this doesn't feel like I'm in a corridor and you're in a room. This just all feels like a beautiful space with light both sides. And this curve has worked really well. That was really good. It was a great idea. It's just opened up this whole space. Alistair and Karen's choice of lighting improves it further. 
A line of pendant fittings draws the eye down the corridor and exposed bulbs minimise shadows. Using coloured glass blocks to break up the curved wall also lets light through. The other thing that works really well is this yellow. I really love the way this yellow comes all the way in and, and actually makes that very much the bedroom wing, doesn't it? Yeah. I think I dare to use it and actually we love it now. I'm also so pleased to see you have made this polycarbonate door. Yeah, and I really can't wait to see what's on the other side of it. Yeah, actually. let's get in. Oh, wow. This is amazing. What a great space. The double-height, open-plan living dining area is totally unexpected in a rural bungalow. This has the feel of a contemporary loft apartment. The room is filled with light, from the skylights in the vaulted ceiling to the vast picture window, which, just like at the Scottish house, is an inviting spot to settle down and enjoy the view. Do you get a sense of the kind of luxuriousness of space you've got, especially after being in the caravan for all that time? Oh, yeah, definitely. We feel like we've got so much space and just you'd be able to come out there and look all the way through that window is brilliant. This whole axis of the house is long and roomy and visually connected to the outside. I think it's really successful. The flow through the house is helped by the huge sliding door made with Piers' suggestion of polycarbonate sheets. This is a bit of material that's different from most other things in the building, but actually what it does is let light all the way through. Mm -hmm. And instead of being something that's very heavy and difficult to operate, this is, you know, you can operate this with your little finger, but that is just an agricultural track. Yeah. Piers, this is exactly your take. You're constantly trying to convince people to do things with industrial yeah. materials. You've got galvanised <laughs> and polycarbonate. I can well, see how happy just, you are. It's just kind of what people do in rural places. I mean, <laughs> this stuff is off the peg, We're, you know. We weren't going to do it. We ran out of money, essentially. But at the 11th hour, we pressed on with it um, and we put it together ourselves, basically on the floor here. How much the, was this frame? The frame was £90 for all aluminium and the two sheets were £110 each. A bespoke door for this would have cost probably three times what it cost us there. So by doing it ourself, it certainly um, helped that side of things. I think you're being too modest. I don't <laughs> think it's just about cost. I think you made some really good choices. Yeah. and I'd love to have yeah. that in the place I lived in. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Totally. The kitchen area is dominated by an island which doubles as a breakfast bar. After our visit to Kildare, Alistair and Karen took on board how important it is to get the positioning right and have made sure their island has plenty of space to move around. I really love the choices you've made here spatially and here we're now inside this beautiful window which we're admiring from the outside. It's quite unusual, actually. It's great with the worktop going all the way through to the window. Totally. And of course, the window mm -hmm. actually makes total sense in here when you sit down. And I think it's the best place for a window in the kitchen, partly because of this eye level, but also because you don't lose any wall space, because it's below where yeah. you need to put storage. And here there is plenty of space for storage, as, after a bit of convincing, Alistair wholeheartedly took on Piers's idea for a pegboard. I was slightly sceptical, but love it. Mm -hmm. uh, totally it's great to, great to hear you say that, because actually, <laughs> you know, when I last came, those three units were swimming in all this white space, and the kitchen didn't make sense. And the point of the pegboard was to anchor this kitchen into the architecture, which I think yeah. it does. Absolutely. This looks like it's, you know, the thousand quid option to add on to the kitchen, but instead it's, what, 100 quid, 150 quid? Oh, far less, 30, 40 quid. Wow. It was really cheap to do. The whole space is a great success and is beautifully finished. Their attention to detail continues in the other block, with two high-quality bathrooms and three bedrooms, including Matthew's first room. Big bro. It must be quite a special moment, in a way, to have him in his first real bedroom. Yeah, his first proper bedroom with his own bed and all, just all his stuff around him. And we can tell Matthew built this house and he, he will remember bits of this being um, built this house. And obviously, also was literally brought up across the road and he played in this field. And, you know, we have pictures, we have one here with... Oh, yeah. Alistair and this is his daddy. And this That's is Alistair. Just, we have wow. pictures like this of them growing up in this place. And part of the idea of the house was giving you both security and a base yeah. to, to, you know, whatever might happen with with Well, that's it. Well. And with Arthur's um, MS, you know, just knowing that we're in a bungalow and in a house that can accommodate what 
hopefully might not come in the future, but what might be part of our future, you know, that we can basically grow old in this house. Alistair and Karen have got the family home they dreamt of, which can take them into that future. Got a nice team. But at what cost? So when I came to see you guys in the winter, it was freezing cold here, it was a shell of a house. You were already approaching the £100,000 mark. Tell me where you're up to now with the budget. Uh, to date, we're £141,800 as of two nights ago. There's a couple of small bills to come in for steel work and bits and pieces, but we're probably anticipating 143,000 all told. It's obviously a big percentage over the 100,000 pounds. You've got 20 something thousand mm -hmm. before you even got above ground mm -hmm. here. But how have you been able to cover that cost? Well, it just is we did run out of money on it. We approached the bank, we've borrowed 18,000 from them. Um, we've used credit cards. We've borrowed a little bit of my mum. Uh, we've used whatever little bit of savings we had. So really, we've, we had to scrape through to the end, but we wanted to finish. So rather than have a half finished project, we went as far as we could to get, get sure. it finished. Uh, no, I mean, it must be stressful having, having to be hand to mouth like that. Yeah, it's stressful. Um, I'm just glad it's over, that's all I would say. It's, <laughs> if you do it once, you're half mad. If you do it ever again, you're fully mad. <laughs> Certainly, there's a lot of lessons as a beginner. You, know, you make mistakes, but you learn lessons. This is a really good house for Alistair and Karen and their family, but it's a really good model for self-builders everywhere because it shows that self-building isn't about adding things to make your house better. It's about thinking cleverly about detail, material, space and light. What I really like is that they've been so up for the ride. They really enjoyed going to see places with Kieran. They've really enjoyed exploring ideas with me on site and the whole process of exploration. They haven't been fixed in their ideas. They've been totally up for seeing what's around the corner. Have you managed to meet your own expectations, that kind of dream you had at the beginning for this project? Well, the day really I ever met Alistair, he always wanted to build a house at home, you know, and really we started out with a modest budget, wanting a modest house on this site, um, and I do think we've exceeded that by far. It's a beautiful house and... Um, yeah, to be able to bring Matthew up here where Alistair was brought up is, is, you know, a real treat, really. Personally, I think we've far exceeded yeah. it, and it's turned out much nicer and better than what we ever thought. Good quality, low-cost architecture in a rural setting is really rare in the UK, and I think what Alistair and Karen have made here is a building that's respectful of its context, is dignified, it's well-made, it's a great example of that type. But I think perhaps even more than that, this is a building that has a deeper meaning. No one loves this site more than they do. And they've got all the same hopes and fears and expectations for their family that any family has. They've made a building that will have a long life, that will accommodate their futures. And I think that's why this is such a great role model of what low-cost building can be. Next time... Oh, very lovely. Derek and Christine love the modern. Oh, yes. And the quirky... I love the door handles. But plans for their home don't add up. It's an off-the-peg staircase and off-the-peg doors. If you can build a house that's anything, why would you do that? And a devastating blow threatens the entire house. We have been advised to stop work on site. We've worked on this project for a year, and is it all to waste?